everyone. Uh, thank you, Fernando, for the introduction. Um, well, as Fernando said, uh, we are going to go through the calculation of energy savings for heating now. The next lecture will be uh, the same uh, structure, the same lecture, but for cooling measures. Um, so this is going to be the agenda for today. We're going to make a brief introduction first. And uh, after, after that, we, we're going to do uh, a whole bunch of saving measures, uh, splitting in those uh, four sections. And finally, we are going to, to do some, uh, well, two examples um, about the replacement of a conventional boiler and finally a uh, PDHP system. So let's begin. Well, as, as we talked uh, in the last webinar, um, this is, uh, well, we're going to talk about the heating system now. And uh, just to remind uh, you uh, which parameters that have influence on the, on the heating system. Um, well, uh, the parameters that have influence on it are, of course, comfort parameters such as temperature, humidity, or air quality, and other influential factors, such as weather, size, frequency, and isolation. Those all um, imply uh, difference in um, energy performance in uh, all the three main systems uh, involved in the heating system, which are the heat production systems, the distribution systems, and terminal systems. Uh, in this slide, in the past lecture, we talked about the difference between the energy demand and energy consumption. I'm not going to get deeper on that now, but just to remind you that there are uh, different uh, concepts and uh, that uh, in uh, winter, we, what, we, what we need to remind is that we're going to have uh, some inflows here, which are going to be the um, radiation heat, which uh, obviously comes from the sun, occupancy, which comes from the people who work in the building or live in the building, and equipment and lighting. And we're going to have some outflows, which are going to uh, hurt me during the calculation of the energy demand, uh, which are going to be the conduction heat and the implication heat. We're going to get deeper in these outflows uh, just uh, in the following slides. But just to remind you that the quantity of, uh, of heating that we need to put inside of the building uh, are going to be the subtraction between the inflows and the outflows, as it is, uh, as, as you can see in this um, formula here. Okay, we're going to be based into this formula uh, in order to uh, understand the different measures we're going to talk about in a few slides. So. Uh, types of saving measures. We have divided the, this, well, more or less, uh, all of the energy saving measures can be split in these four sections, uh, which are uh, the demand reduction, okay? Some examples of demand reduction could be the increase uh, of the envelope isolation um, to shade windows, for instance. Uh, we can also talk about uh, equipment replacement. Okay, in this case, uh, lots of examples can come on, can come to our minds. Some of them are boiler replacement, chill replacement, you know, LED replacement. Uh, we also have increase of performance. Okay, and uh, without the need of uh, installing new, fully new equipment, such as to shade chillers in order to reduce, for instance, the um, temperature at which the thermal exchange is taking place, uh, heat pipes, isolation, or a full installation of a CHP system, which involves a uh, huge increase of performance and therefore a uh, saving of primary energy. And finally, what we have is the adaptation of the heating system, some adaptations in order to match the demand to the activity of the building. And uh, an example of this could be the change of the constant volume 
for the secondary circuit, hidden circuits, to viral volume. Okay. Now, uh, let's talk about demand reduction. Well, uh, obviously, in demand reduction, we have to reduce consumption. And to reduce heating demand, uh, what you can do is, as we, as we, as we, have, uh, as we, as we have seen in the previous slide with the inflows and outflows, is to reduce the outflows, the, the heating, the, the heat that, um, that, that are um, hurting me in the calculation of, of the energy demand, which are the conduction heat and the infiltration or ventilation heat. If we just uh, want to reduce consumption, what we're, what we're going to do, what we're gonna do is uh, just to increase performance, okay? That will only lead to uh, reduced consumption, not to reduce demand. So again, this is, this is going to be the, this is going to be the formula we will use. So obviously, if we want to diminish this, the heating demand uh, needed for acclimatizing a building or a room, uh, obviously, what we need to do is to reduce these two parameters: this, the conduction, and the implications. So first, what we can do to reduce conduction? Well, as we can see here, the conduction can be more or less uh, explained with that formula, which, uh, as we can see, depends on the difference between the exterior temperature and the interior temperature, the set point. Um, so the different, the, the how we can uh, reduce the conduction then. So we could um, or uh, increase in the set point or decrease in the exterior temperature. Well, as we can't uh, uh, act to the, to the weather, that is, uh, the, the latter is difficult to do, but what we can do is to uh, increase the, um, the interior temperature. Well, things that we can do at this, uh, at this, um, at this time, we can uh, replace doors and windows for, um, uh, for instance, uh, windows with uh, thermal um, bridge breakage. We can improve wall insulation. Um, for instance, well, uh, talking about wall insulation, normally people think that uh, just improving wall insulation is good uh, every time. But that is not at all uh, true. Uh, you could improve uh, a lot wall insulation in um, in uh, northern Europe, in Eastern Europe, but um, please be careful of what you do when talking about hot climates, or maybe um, better said, climates uh, which has both uh, hot climates in uh, in some hot temperatures in summer and cold temperatures in winter. Because uh, what uh, you're going to do is, if you improve a lot the insulation in a building which has uh, those characteristics, which uh, it, it is um, um, it is in in, in a in a weather in a in a, in a weather in, in a climate zone where the where you have very hot summers and very cold winters, is uh, that in the winter is going to be very good for you because you are going to reduce a lot the conduction heat and the infiltration heat. But in, uh, in summer, when uh, you, let's get back to the, to the previous slide, when you are going to have this again, but in, in summer you're going to have the, the inflows are going to, instead of helping you or hurting you, uh, this heat is going to be much more, more. If you have a very good insulation, it's going to be much difficult to take them to take uh, it outside. So it is not a good thing to insulate a lot if you have if you uh, are going to have a very hot summer, because uh, that will hurt you at the end. So let's get back to where we were. Um, okay. Also, we can uh, improve duct insulation. Um, and this is a quite important thing, and, uh, and, um, and it is impressive the huge amount of savings we can uh, we can achieve 
just with this uh, measure, uh, we have um, uh, we have audited lots of buildings with uh, actually newer, very, very new buildings that has for um, that the pipes for uh, hot water are made of uh, instead of uh, copper are made of uh, uh, polypropylene, a pl kind of plastic which is uh, now very is widely used for for tubes and, and, and pipes for, for hot water. And uh, the maintenance people think just because they are from uh, made of plastic that they not, don't need to be insulated. Well, that's wrong because it is true that the, the, um, uh, it is, uh, they, are, uh, they are not conducting such as good as the, as the, as the copper pipes but the, it is needed to, to insulate them a lot uh, as well. I mean, um, for instance, I can remember a building here in Madrid that has, uh, had a, a whole system pipes with uh, polypropylene and they weren't um, um, isolated. So what we did is just to calculate the savings, and we are going to, and just for isolating the whole uh, pipes made of propylene, we were going to achieve more than 40% of savings in the hot water uh, in hot water consumption. So it is a lot, and it needs to be considered. So uh, now let's talk about reduced loss in infiltration, the other part, the other outflows that we had in, in our little uh, square uh, in the previous slide. To reduce the uh, infiltration heat, well, the formula it is more or less the same. It talks about the enthalpies this time, which are, of course, related to the temperatures. Um, so uh, this, uh, the, the, um, the target here is to avoid air leaks in doors and, and windows. And, uh, and for instance, for that, we can we can uh, do some uh, uh, improvement in the in the windows. We we have we don't want to to renew them uh, completely. We can just use weather strips. Um, we can also use our curtains or double door or double doors. As we can see here, depending on when uh, of where you are going to use them. You can use your curtains, for instance, in shops that have um, big, big, very big doors, or even no doors. And normally, owners want them to to be completely open. In the case they have doors, uh, so air curtains can achieve um, quite a lot of savings, of HVAC savings. Uh, talking about double doors or revolving doors, they are normally used in public buildings or in buildings which uh, there is a need for security. Uh, they separate uh, the exterior from the interior uh, and, uh, quite, quite well, and they can achieve um, uh, a lot of savings by this. Uh, let's talk now about uh, equipment replacement. Well, um, the replacement of major equipment uh, that make up the heating system involve uh, normally uh, very high energy savings. The problem is, of course, the money. Uh, examples about equipment replacement. Well, we can uh, change the actual boiler for a more efficient one. We can change the heat pumps, change the chillers, or change the LED lamps. You know, at the end, you can change any equipment um, which has uh, enough uh, room enough to uh, improve the performance uh, a lot. Um, the main disadvantage, as I said, of this measure is of this type of measure is that the replacement of equipment of equipment is generally very very expensive. So it is normal that for this type of um, replacement, a deep analysis, a deep a technical and economical analysis. Uh, should be performed, and uh, parameters such as the um, um, payback period or the internal rate of, re of return are normally used in order to see if uh, the savings of these measures can overcome the economic barrier. 
So because of that, they are very, very interesting in all facilities where the depreciation time of the old equipment is uh, near to zero. And, uh, and uh, any time they are going to, to fail. So it is a good time to not only renew the equipment, but also to buy the best equipment you can find in the market. Uh, and some of the time, you're going to have a legal obligation. For instance, in Chile, in Chile you may know that in some countries, uh, the refrigerant R22 is uh, forbidden. So in those cases, you are changing the chiller not only just because the, you, you're going to spend the, sorry, you, you, you're going to uh, have a better performance, but also because you have a legal obligation that implies, that obliges you to, to, to change that. Uh, so uh, now let's talk about the increase of performance without uh, the need of changing the whole equipment. Uh, we can change um, boilers burners from one to two steps burner to a modulated burner, for instance. Um, we can uh, talk about uh, heat recovery systems, both in chillers or in boilers. Um, in chillers, the heat recovery systems are normally used for um, obtaining free or more or less free um, hot water uh, during the summer, which is uh, quite tough in some places because normally in summer the um, hot water demand decreases quite a lot. So this can only this solution can only be used in some places. Uh, and you can also um, use heat recovery systems in boilers, which uh, essentially what it does is to, well, heat recovery systems in boilers only apply to conventional boilers. You cannot apply that into a condensing boiler, for instance, because actually what it does is to turn a conventional boiler into a condensing boiler. What it does is to recoup to to get the um, to to take advantage of the um, high temperature uh, of of the steam to condense it and to and to use that heat to to heat hot water, for instance, um, uh, to heat hot water or to or to just uh, or to just improve the performance of the boiler, which is actually what is the, the normal thing to do in, in this type of heating recovery system for, for boilers, I, increasing the performance uh, just as the condensing boiler does. Uh, also, you could, we can isolate that or uh, install a CHP system. We're going to dig in that uh, system in the following slides. So, um, Obviously, having equipment working with higher performance has a direct effect on uh, its energy consumption. And, uh, well, these measures are generally more profitable because they are less, expen less expensive, but the savings also are usually lower. And this is, uh, these um, measures are really, really interesting in those places where the um, equipment is uh, quite new. Uh, it is still quite new, and you can't uh, spend a lot of money. You can't, uh, yeah, spend a lot of money in new equipment. So another thing you can do to increase performance is reducing the comfort temperature in winter. Well, uh, we can. We have to be careful about this. Of course, we are not going to freeze people. Uh, but uh, it is possible to um, decrease a little bit the um, uh, comfort temperature in some buildings. It is uh, mostly known that the better or the most indicated comfort temperature for buildings is uh, depending on, it is true that depending on the country, but between 21 to 22 more or less. Uh, so uh, that is because the, if, you, um, in, if you increase 
that set point temperature, you're going to increase the heat conduction, uh, sorry, the, conduct the conduction heat and the infiltration heat. And also, the energy performance uh, ratio, the energy efficiency ratio of the heat pumps are going to be less if you have a bigger, if you have a bigger set point, if you have to heat more the, to a, the building. And so, and uh, at the end, what we take from some studies is that for every degree reduced in indoor temperature, an energy saving of about 7% of consumption is achieved. So it is quite a big energy, energy saving. Those are quite big energy savings uh, in order to consider this type of, of measure. Uh, and finally, we have here uh, the adaptation of heating system. Okay, so uh, the thing of these uh, measures, uh, measures related to the adaptation of heating system, is that normally the, um, the energy demand of a building doesn't really match with the activity of that building, and that is a problem. For instance, let me put an example about a hotel. Um, we could imagine that a hotel with uh, uh, the consumption uh, of a hotel of, uh, with 20% uh, of occupancy would be much less than the same hotel with an occupancy of 90%. But the reality tells us that that isn't true uh, because Mm, well, the end, the, 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 the consumption of a hotel it is more or less the same regardless of the occupancy they have. And that is a bad thing, a very bad thing to, for, for a hotel. Uh, the, the operative costs are much higher. So one thing, to, well, things that we can do to uh, try to match that energy demand to the occupancy in the case of the hotel or to the activity in general uh, you know, terms talking about buildings, is, for instance, um, using inverters for pumps in a, uh, or, or in cooling towers, uh, or just uh, in, when when you do some replacement of a of a chair, even a replacement chair, just uh, buy a chair with a, with an inverter or a heat pump with an inverter, which will help you to modulate the exact power you're going to need for acclimatizing. Uh, the different rooms of the building. You can also control the ventilation flow. So what we mean, because what we uh, what we mean um, with this, well, uh, most of uh, most of the people think that the ventilation unit is a very small part of the energy balance of a building, but it isn't quite true because when you are ventilating, you are taking out uh, acclimatized, already acclimatized hair uh, into, into the exterior. To the exterior. So, and, and then you, when you're going to renew it, uh, when you're going mm, uh, to take some of the air from the outside to the inside, you are going to need to acclimatize it again. So it's not only the um, consumption for uh, for the fun or of the of the structure of the or of the air handling unit, but also the the consumption from the production system that needs to again acclimatize in the air. So what we can do here is to turn your conventional air handling units into smart handling units uh, with the aid of um, CO2 probes or temperature or humidity probes, which tells exactly when uh, when the air handling unit needs to turn on and uh, provide uh, and refresh uh, the air according to the normal regulations of, of each country. So this is a good thing to do. Uh, another thing is changing the regulation system in the boiler or uh, Turning uh, the distribution system, uh, a fixed distribution system, into a variable flow um, distribution system, uh, so that the um, terminal units such as fan coils 
uh, only get uh, the exact uh, amount of thermal energy from the production systems when uh, when, it, when it is needed. Well, now is the time of some examples about this. We're going we're gonna to make uh, now, uh, I would like you to follow me in the replacement of a conventional boiler with a condensing boiler. Well, first of all, in every replacement, we have an initial situation and a final situation. We need to compare both and to see which are the, difference, which are the differences, and, uh, and uh, provided that, we're going to get the energy savings and the, well, the, the CO2 differences and, and that stuff. So what is the description of my actual heating system? Imagine that we have a hotel and, uh, and this, the heating supply is carried out centrally through two diesel boilers, which uh, its main characteristics are that Mm, they both have a power output of 450 kilowatts and a nominal yield and a, a nominal performance of 87%. But it happens that when doing the audit, the auditor has uh, measured the, the performance of the, bill of the boiler with, um, with a gas analyzer. Um, and uh, he has realized that uh, the real yield uh, it is 82 percent, only 82 percent, because of the you know the burner is not perfectly adjusted or or just because the boiler is quite old. So the manufacturer tell us that the nominal yield is 87 percent, but actually once measured, the real yield was 82 percent. And we know because uh, because that uh, because of we, we have the bills, we know that the annual diesel consumption is 790,000 uh, kilowatt hour per year. Okay, with that, we are going to propose the final situation. Okay, and the final situation would be the following: uh, we are going to change these two diesel fuel boilers to natural gas by, well, installing to, to gas boilers, and um, we're going to consider that each one of the new boilers has a real yield of 90%, okay? Those are conventional boilers, high efficiency conventional boilers. We're uh, taking into account uh, some losses, and that is why the real yield, we're, we're saying, we're, very, we're, we're being very conservative, and we're saying that the real yield is going to be 90%. So we're going to calculate the annual savings that will be achieved by installing these new natural gas boilers, and we're going to, we're going to um, um, perform the estimation of the energy and economic savings and um, uh, how much emissions we are going to reduce. So the data we're going to use is the following. We're going to uh, uh, use the cost of the diesel fuel uh, and the cost of natural gas of Six cents and four cents. Please don't expect this to be accurate according to your country. This is uh, a thing which changes a lot between countries and uh, and, and each time. Um, the CO2 emission factor is going to we're going to use is uh, 0 0.26 kilograms CO2 per kilowatt hour for diesel and only 0 0.2 kilograms CO2 kilowatt hour per natural gas. Okay, and the investment required is going to be 10,000 uh, euros for each boiler and a month power of 5,000 euros for all the work. So, what do we have to do uh, first? Because we, the, the green numbers here are the things that we already have, okay? We have uh, two units of fuel we have 450 um, kilowatts each, and we have a nominal yield of 87, a, a real yield of 82 percent, and a consumption from the bills of this. So the first thing we need to do is to calculate the demand. 
And for that, what we need to do is to multiply the consumption by the real yield. And that gives us 648,000 kilowatt hours. That is, the, is our demand. It's the demand of the building, according to the, um, the, all, the, all the load, all the thermal loads, according to the envelope, and, and, and that, okay? It is a simple estimation, but it, it serves quite well. Uh, the total costs are going to be the, the unit cost, okay, of six cents per kilowatt hour multiplied by the number of kilowatt hour. Uh, and that is going to be this, uh, 47,000 uh, 47, euros. And the CO2 emissions are going to be uh, this, which is uh, the unit emissions, they are kilograms per kilowatt hour ratio, and uh, multiplied by the consumption. Okay. Uh, and the final boiler, so this is for the initial boiler, okay? We, we have, uh, the, the main exercise here is just to get the demand, okay? And the final boiler, uh, the real, uh, the known data, sorry, is again the green numbers. Uh, what uh, we're going to use is a real deal of 90%. And of course, we're going to use the same demand, demand that we have calculated before, because uh, the demand isn't going to change. The building is the same, the weather is going to be the same, the occupancy, we suppose, is going to be the same. Uh, the only thing that changes is actually the boiler. And that is why we need to calculate the new consumption according to the real yield. And for that, we have to do the reverse um, uh, estimation, uh, which is uh, to divide the demand uh, by the real yield. And that leads us to this. Okay. We also calculate the total cost and the total CO2 emissions. Okay. Now we have here the results. First, in this table, we have the annual savings. The energy savings are just the subtraction between the uh, initial boiler demand, sorry, the initial boiler consumption, and the final boiler consumption, which is 70,000 uh, kilowatt hours. We're going to be to do the same with the economic saving, and we're going to we're going to do the same with um, CO2 emissions with the reduction. Okay. Here we have the investment requirement. Okay, as we said, uh, each boiler cost is with this man power, and total costs are then this. This multiplied by two plus this is going to be this. So the simple payback is going to be the division between the total cost, the investments, between, uh, by, sorry, uh, divided by the savings, okay, which are this, sorry, this. And this leads us to 1.4 of symbol payback time, which is quite good. Okay, let's move on to the next example, installation of a CCH pit system which stands for heating, cooling, and, um, and electricity generation. So this is what is called a heat generation, okay? Uh, which is the process by which some of the heat produced by a generation plant is used to generate chilled water for air conditioning or refrigerator, or refrigeration. Uh, in this case, an absorption chiller is linked to the combined heat and power. Uh, to provide this functionality. So, what we <coughs> have here is the motor data we have used. We've used a uh, uh, specific uh, type of motor. Uh, these are, um, mm, this, this table shows the, some features of the, of the motor taken from the manufacturer, from the supplier. Uh, which shows the different motor, uh, the different loads at which the motor can uh, work from 50% to 100% of load, which will be the full load. Uh, the electric power uh, at these loads are this. This will be the thermal, the thermal power which can uh, supply as each one of the motor loads are going to be this, from uh, 600 to 900. 
kilowatt, uh, yep, kilowatt, and the gas consumption is going to be from uh, one uh, thousand, from one megabyte, one megawatt to one point eight megawatt. <coughs> okay, with that in mind, what we need to do with um, uh, when we try to size a CHP installation. The first thing we need to do, uh, well, uh, 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 first of all, this, uh, a CHP installation is very sensitive to the number of hours it is going to work. According to the number of hours, we're going to see if uh, the CHP is going to be profitable or if it's not going to be profitable. So in order to perform a good analysis, in order to, to to come out with that answer, we need to analyze uh, the whole energy behavior of that building. Uh, and for that, we're going to use, we're going to need uh, the load curves of the building, uh, mainly taken from the utility company. Uh, but if you don't have it, what you can do is just to use a power analyzer uh, to the connected to the main electric board for maybe two months or so in order to achieve a little uh, uh, a little table like this. Okay, in this case, this table shows us the first six days of January in 2011, as you can see, for uh, from midnight to two o'clock a.m. Okay, this is just. Uh, uh, this is, of course, not the total table. We will need several thousand pages for showing all the, the tables. So I have just scooted this for, for the example. But, but this is the power demand in each quarter hour, okay? which is uh, draw it here, okay? the quarter um, uh, demand for January for a mean day. Okay? And, uh, and this is the HVAC demand. Okay. Um, okay. So once we have that information, uh, we need to uh, take into account that uh, normally in those uh, buildings that we're going to use, in which we are we we, we could uh, install a CHP power plant, uh, they could be tertiary or industrial. So they're going to have a uh, probably different uh, tariffs periods for each uh, time. Uh, as you can see in, in, in this table, well, for these hours, uh, we're going to have the same period, but if we have here maybe 10 o'clock of uh, 30, 31st of December of 2010, uh, we probably would have a, a different uh, Period, a, a different tariff period, much much uh, much expensive than than the number six, which is the actually the cheapest. Okay, and uh, and for that, using this period and the consumption in each quarter, okay, uh, uh, which is just the power demand divided by four, the consumption because you are four quarters, uh, we could uh, achieve to get the electricity cost. Okay. Once that is done, mm, we have to do a very deep analysis per hour or quarter hour in which several characteristics should be studied. Okay. So be focused here. This is quite tough. Um, first, we we have again here the, the date and time. Okay. This this table is split in two. Okay. So this uh, part actually goes right here. Okay just for you to know. But first, what we need to establish is when the CHP is going to work. In this example, the, um, the building which we were going to install this CHP was a terminal, a terminal building in an airport. Okay, So we decided to use only CHP when the HVAC was on, was needed. So the the HVAC was uh, was going to turn it, it is all the days turning turning on at seven o'clock in the morning, 
so as you can see, uh, the CHP is only on uh, from seven o'clock to till uh, I think eleven o'clock in the in the at night. I think it, it was something like that. Uh, so we first uh, analyzed the HVAC consumption taken from the load curves we've seen before. The HVAC demand, okay, which is just the consumption from the load curves multiplied by the energy efficiency of the systems. In this case, uh, this terminal building had um, heat pumps, so uh, you will find that this it is more or less this multiplied by 3.4 or something like that, which was the energy efficiency ratio of the heat pumps. Uh, then we need to find what would be the thermal energy tree generation uh, created by the CCHP power plant, uh, which depends on uh, the load at which the motor is working. At this time, the load would be more or less 75%. So if we get back to the to the um, uh, to the table here, we can see that the thermal power for that load would be more or less 7, uh, 727, uh, 727. So if we get back, the, this part is thermal energy to regeneration is just the model thermal power divided by 4. Okay, just to get the consumption. <coughs> uh, here we have the, just the model thermal power, okay, which is what we have just seen, and uh, the energy used. Well, this, the, the THP is going to generate some energy, okay, so we need to find how much of that thermal energy we're going to use. And we're going to use this, which is, of course, the demand that we have. Okay. The energy lost is, of course, the difference between this, because between the generation and the and what we're going to take. Okay, which is in this case 47 for this uh, three quarters. The CHP load I I've already talked about that, and um, this is the uh, HVAC demand covered by grid electricity. Well. In these three cases, in these three cells, we we didn't have uh, HVAC, so we of course we we weren't uh, we, we didn't uh, we uh, didn't need any any electricity from the grid. But in this ones, we 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 could need it, but it is already covered by the uh, CHP power plant. Okay, so we didn't need to get anything from the grid. If we go down here, of course, the, 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 it would be the consumption covered by the grid. So if we don't have nothing here in the demand, we are going, we're not going to have nothing here, of, of course. And uh, this uh, is the building electricity consumption, okay, the HVC consumption. Uh, sorry, this, but, um, okay, this is the building electricity consumption minus the HV, the, the HVC, the climatizing for the building. Okay, we, we could we could take this from the load curves. Okay, um, and it is this. This uh, we can take this from the load curves. Uh, and, and in this column, what we see is the electricity power uh, generated by the uh, cogeneration plant, which is of course again depending on the load curves, like in this part. Uh, on the sorry, on the load curve, on the load of the of the motor, uh, at 75 percent motor load, the related electricity power is is going to be this exactly. So, uh, in this case, we didn't need uh, well uh, in this column, what we what we see is the electricity that we want to take from the grid, and as you already know, in these three cells. As we are in from 6:15 uh, to 6:45, uh, sorry, to, to 7 actually, um, as the heating, the HVAC system is not uh, is not working, uh, the CHP plant is is going to be off. Okay, so we're not going to generate anything from the electricity. That is why here is zero. 
So obviously, all the electricity demand that uh, the building has needs will be needs to be covered by the taking it from the grid. And, um, and in these cases where the PHP is working, well, it is just the difference. We are we we need 137 here, and we're going to generate 128. So the difference is going to be eight, which is the amount of energy we need to take from the grid. In this case, it's zero and zero because the uh, electricity generated is more than the electricity that we need. Okay. So here in this column, what we have is the surplus uh, electricity, which is just the difference between this and this, the electricity power generated and the uh, building electricity consumption. Uh, so in this case, we will have some surplus that we will need to dissipate it or to, uh, we can to um, input into the grid if, uh, if the regulation permits that. And uh, here that we, what we have is the fuel consumption, uh, which is going to be needed uh, from natural gas, and which is going to be needed depending on, again, the um, CHP motor load. Okay, this will help us to calculate the cogeneration costs, operative costs, and, uh, and uh, of course we have here zero because the CHP is not working, and here we have this, the same amount, because the, the cogeneration is working at the same load. And um, here we have in this column the electricity costs because of the buying of energy from the grid, okay? And the total costs are just the normal sum between all of these, uh, all of these two columns. Okay, uh, more or less with that, uh, we're going to have some results, assuming all the results we're taking from the total cost, the fuel consumption, the energy, energy use, and that. And more or less, the final results from this installation would be uh, something like this. Uh, we get a working hours of uh, 4,571. More or less, it is normally considered that a CHP it depends on the on the situation and the country and the activity of the building you're, you're going to implement it on. But normally, uh, if, you, um, if you are above 3,000 hours per year, it is good, okay? But 4,571 uh, hours is good enough here. So we have a gas consumption of this amount. Uh, the electricity produced is going to be this, and the thermal energy produced is going to be this. We don't need accumulation, okay, because we're not going to use this to, uh, uh, for hot water, just for heating and cooling. And, uh, well, the thermal energy is going to be this. Um, the coverage of the whole thermal energy is going to be an um, uh, 88%, which is uh, really, really good. So, 